paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. Summer 2001. The national capital of Quebecers vibrates to the strains of an idyllic late summer. The buskers make their final laps. The crowd enjoys the final chords of major public concerts. Fall is knocking at the door. On the morning of August 22nd, Quebec City comes out of its summer euphoria by the discovery of a body on the banks of the St. Charles River. Sergeant Detective Sylvain Tremblay of the Quebec City Police is assigned to the case. We received a call at our offices around one in the afternoon that an individual had been found in the St. Charles River. There was a lot of blood at the scene and it seemed very suspicious. The forensic identification unit was called to the crime scene to assess everything from the beginning. That's the first job of an investigator to determine whether in fact it's a murder or an accident or if it's a suicide. The forensic identification unit marks a large crime scene. They methodically work their investigation inward toward the body. The evidence found in the area immediately indicates to investigators that this is most likely a violent crime. When we arrived, we expanded the crime scene because it was obvious that it was a homicide. And in fact, the first crime scene was the upper level where we could see that there had been a fight because there were bloodstains on the ground. And then we had the second part of the scene, which was the lower level where the victim fell. In fact, we could see that the second crime scene continued down because at the bottom, there was a, a pool of blood much larger than on the upper level, as if someone had bled profusely at that spot. And the third crime scene was where the body was found uh, in the water uh, by the wall that runs alongside the river. So there was the upper crime scene, the lower crime scene, and then the scene where the body was found. The main things we found were traces of blood from which several samples were taken. And then we found two types of pills. The pills were integral to the crime scene because they were found with the blood. And then several other things were recovered, such as uh, cigarette butts and beer cans, uh, which we sent for analysis to try and determine the DNA. The investigation is moving at a good pace, but the work of Detective Sergeant Tremblay will soon get complicated. I would say that after an hour of being at the scene, we received a phone call at the station informing us that on the other side of the river, there was something resembling the canvas or a kind of tarp that was near the body. So we moved, we went to the other side of the river and marked a perimeter around that area. We could tell right away that the tarp we found at the original crime scene was 99% likely to have come from the tarp on the north side of the river because of the cut marks on it. You could see, even without an exhaustive analysis, that the first piece found with the body was probably 
cut from the second piece of tarp. No one knew why we had a piece uh, that was on one side and then another piece that was on the other side. Meanwhile, the corpse covered with a blanket still lies on the edge of the St. Charles River. I went down with the forensic identification technician to take photos and to search the pockets of the individual because he had not been identified. We could already see that he had facial injuries. We searched the body where it lay on the riverbed, and the only thing that was found on the young person's pockets was a ticket to Expo Quebec. It was the only thing he had on him, no identification, no money. Expo Quebec is the annual fair that takes place every August in the popular Vanier district near the Quebec Coliseum. Police notice that the body has not been carried away by the St. Charles River. In addition, they notice the water level is unusually low. The city of Quebec had decided to lower the St. Charles River at night, but exactly when the body was uncovered by the water, uh, when the water receded completely, we don't know. All we know is that two pedestrians passing by the area at around 12.30, 12.40 p.m. spotted the body. The body had certainly been in the water for at least 12 hours, but how long it had been uncovered, we didn't know. Detective Sergeant Tremblay thinks the body did not drift after it fell into the water. The body was found exactly in line with the bloodstains and the pills. We could see that it hadn't floated a bit. It really stayed there where it had fallen. The water level was perhaps already just two feet or so, and the body stayed anchored in the mud. Uh, the victim was very dirty because the river was quite polluted and uh, when the water level went down it left a lot of black marks on the body. His shirt was almost torn from his body, it was held on only by one sleeve. Uh, we could see that he was very thin, not very tall, uh, but we thought he was about 20, 22 years old. The investigation soon reveals that Quebec City has drained the river to conduct major development work on the banks of the St. Charles River. When we started the shoreline naturalization project uh, and river cleanup, it was conducted over a period of nearly four years, particularly in summer, when we could voluntarily lower the level of the river by opening the Samson Dam gates. The water level of the St. Charles River is controlled by a dam located downstream from the crime scene. The Samson Dam maintains a constant water level in the river and ensures a minimum water supply to a paper mill located downstream. When the river flow is reduced by the electric gates, the impact on the flow is considerable. The effects were felt almost five kilometers away. With the slope of the riverbed, certain parts of the river went from being 40 to 50 meters wide to 10 meters wide, and with only a few feet of water at the bottom of the river. Hubert de Gagné is a former member of the Canadian Coast Guard Marine Rescue Unit based in Quebec City. He knows the St. Charles River intimately. As a rule, when there is a drowning, the body sinks at the spot where the drowning occurred. And we must wait until the natural decomposition process does its work and the body resurfaces. During the summer in Quebec, the river can easily reach 22, 23 degrees. It depends if the summer is very hot. If so, the decomposition process will be very fast, which means that after three days, the body may resurface. Unlike during the spring, when it can easily take seven or eight days before the body floats to the surface. So that's the difference we can denote. And once it's on the surface, yes, it will drift, but the velocity of the current is practically zero. 
the body can easily stay in one place for several hours, even a day or two, or drift several hundred meters in a day, depending on the time of year and what's happening with the dam. The investigation uncovers two important facts. First, the river flow, even with the help of the Samson Dam, was too slow to carry the body. Secondly, the draining process explains how the body remained on the bank. But as he prepares to move the body to the morgue, Detective Sergeant Tremblay receives a new piece of information. I received a phone call informing me that minutes earlier a youth had been reported missing to the Haute St. Charles uh, Municipal Police and that there's a possibility that it is our victim. The Haute St. Charles Municipal Police looked into it and gave us a description. It seemed that it was probably the young man we had found because of the description of his clothing, especially his shirt. From there we believed that it corresponded to the mother's call about her missing son. Even though they have a description of the body found in the St. Charles River, the identity must be confirmed. Could the body lying on the muddy river bank be the missing person? On August 22, 2001, beside the tranquil St. Charles River in Old Quebec, the corpse of a young man without identification is found. Investigators immediately suspect it to be a murder. The crime scene is spread out over three levels along the river and is stained with blood, evidence of a violent death. The security perimeter is very broad, encompassing areas on both banks of the St. Charles. While moving the victim to the morgue, Sylvain Tremblay receives a call about a missing person that could solve the identity of the young man. Tremblay investigates. Uh, another investigator and I went to meet the parents of the victim in the afternoon. And everything was consistent with the description, um, especially the clothing. The victim is formally identified as Charles Tremblay, barely 15 years old. From the moment we're sure of the identity, we start checking the last 24 hours of the victim's life to reconstruct what happened. His mother told us that the day before, she had dropped her son off at Expo Quebec, and she had not heard from him since. So after the family, the next people we met with were the two friends that accompanied the victim to Expo Quebec. Both of Charles' friends are also 15 years old. The police quickly noticed that their versions of events are inconsistent. The two young men that we met with in the afternoon or early evening initially gave us a misleading version of what had happened because they wanted to hide the fact that they went to Uville Square to purchase narcotics. The two teenagers awkwardly try to cover up their actions, but the investigators are not easily fooled. It was a very simple explanation. We had doubts, though, because there were parts of the story where they contradicted one another about where Charles had gone and what time they had last seen him. It was during discussions with the mother that we learned we were missing pieces of the story uh, from the versions his two friends had given us. In fact, the evening at Expo Quebec had gone quite differently. Through a friend of the teenagers, Charles' mother learns what really took place and informs investigators. In fact, uh, this friend of the victim had spoken with one of the youths who had gone to Expo Quebec, and he said that they had gone to Uville Square and had lost track of Charles there. This new information surprised the police because Uville Square is several kilometers from where Charles' body was found. Located in the heart of the Latin Quarter, Uville Square is a focal point during the beautiful summer days. A hub for major cultural events, 
it is also a meeting place for motley youth in search of cheap thrills. We talked to his friends again and explained the seriousness of things, that we were investigating a murder and that it was important to have the truth, even if they're youths. This often happens during questioning where there's a connection to drugs. People try to conceal it and uh, manipulate the truth a bit. The teen's new version of what happened reveals circumstances far different from their first description. The fact is that they had spent the afternoon at Expo Quebec with Charles, and at about 6 p.m. they went to Uville Square to buy some PCP. PCP was very popular in Quebec at the time of the crime. It is a synthetic drug that comes in the form of crystalline powder. It is usually added to tobacco or marijuana and inhaled with the smoke. Its effects are similar to that of hallucinogens or narcotics. Once at Uville Square, the three teenagers try to locate a drug dealer. There, they met with someone uh, they knew who would introduce them to another person who would sell them the PCP. Charles had the other team's money to buy the drugs, and he left with the drug dealer. And that was the last time his friends saw him. At this point, it's almost 8 p.m. The two teens tell the police that they waited a long time for Charles. They waited for at least two or three hours at Uville Square, but Charles never came back. And then they took a bus and just went home. The small-time drug dealers at Uville Square are well known to the police. Officers went to the site with the intent to track down the dealer the three youths met with. We had an accurate description of the person they knew. His nickname was Beef. And then we also had a good description of the PCP dealer that Beef had introduced them to. It was a pretty specific description because the suspect had a mohawk that was bleached, um, a, a little yellow, whitish yellow, and he had a barbell piercing between his eyes uh, with a, a pin here and two balls there. So it was a rather specific description. The guy with the nickname Beef was well known to police. They were able to find him right away. The officers began to question him about the events and he pointed out the suspect in question who was also at Uville Square. And then Beef told the police that our suspect was the guy he had set the three boys up with to buy PCP. The individual in question no longer has his famous mohawk. He shaved it off the previous night, but Beef has no trouble identifying him to the police. Naturally, there were no grounds for arrest. He was very drunk and refused to identify himself, refused to cooperate. Police officers try to question the individual, but he refuses and the situation degenerates rapidly. Severe enough that he started to fight. The individual in question is struggling to the point that investigators have to use pepper spray to subdue him. Finally, he is put under arrest for public drunkenness and refusing to identify himself. Once at the station, police obtain a positive identification of the individual. He is John René Sear, a character well known to the police with a long record. He is so intoxicated that investigators wait until the next day to question him. We interviewed the individual for a long time without succeeding in obtaining an incriminating statement from him. But it became clear that he was a prime suspect because from the answers he gave, we saw that he was hiding important details.
He had in fact changed his looks. He had cut his mohawk and he had removed the barbell that he had uh, in between his eyes. And the information we received was that during the day uh, in a Uville Square restaurant uh, washroom, he shaved off his mohawk. Now that was suspicious behavior. He registered with Alostop for a ride to Saguenay. Uh, for us, that was suspicious behavior because he wanted to flee and he changed his appearance. Although several statements seem to be incriminating, the questioning of Sear reveals nothing else. Legally, the Quebec police can hold Sear in custody for 24 hours. After that period, if he hasn't been charged, he must be released. Sergeant Detective Tremblay has discovered another reason to keep Sear in custody while they gather more evidence. Will this prove his role in the murder of Charles? On August 22, 2001, the unidentified body of a young man is discovered. The evidence points directly to a murder. The investigation reveals the victim is Charles Tremblay, 15. The police learned that the previous night, Tremblay went to Uville Square to purchase PCP. There, he was introduced to a known drug dealer, Jean-René Sear. Sear was apprehended, but police don't have sufficient evidence to charge him with Tremblay's murder. Since Sergeant Detective Tremblay suspects Sear's involvement in the death of young Charles, he searches for grounds to keep Sear in custody. As always in such cases, a thorough investigation into Sears' background is conducted. Two or three weeks before the event, the ex-girlfriend of the suspect had brought a complaint of burglary against him after an argument. She had kicked him out of her apartment, and then a couple of days after that, the suspect had entered through a window while she was in the apartment. He had made death threats to his ex-girlfriend. All of this put together meant we could keep him in custody while we continue our investigation and accumulate evidence to build a case against him later. In fact, this is what allowed us to hold him for a month. Meanwhile, the autopsy results for Charles Tremblay confirm what police already know. An investigator attended the autopsy in Montreal and came back with something to the effect that the youth's root cause of death was drowning. But he also gave us a little description of his injuries, including a fractured skull, which was very important. Investigators believe that the skull fractures Charles sustained can be explained because of the height of a concrete wall that separates the two levels of the crime scene. Charles would have fallen or been thrown over this wall. The pathologist could not formally comment on that aspect, on whether he would have died of the skull fracture or whether he would have survived. But of course, if he'd had immediate care, if he'd been taken to a hospital, it's hard to say, but the official cause of death was drowning because his lungs were filled with water. The day after the discovery of Charles' body, investigators received more important information. A backpack was found on the shore opposite the crime scene. There was an individual who found a backpack with a cell phone inside. And when he heard about the crime on the news, he called to let us know. The backpack actually did belong to the victim. We immediately had it identified by the parents of the victim who, like any parent, knew their son's backpack pretty well. And in fact, it confirmed that something had also happened on the other side of the river. We now had the piece of tarp and the backpack with the cell phone in it, both of which were found on the other side of the river. The cell phone belonged to uh, Mr. Bouchard, who had already reported his cell as stolen, and he suggested that possibly it was the suspect in our case who had taken it, because the day before the murder, the suspect was at Mr. Bouchard's home. Investigators discover that Sear has a particular obsession that could connect him to other crimes. 
Throughout the investigation, we discovered, because several people informed us of it, that he had a habit of grabbing cell phones that were lying around anywhere. I don't know if he felt important that way, but he often had two phones on him. Like when we arrested him, he had two cell phones on him, which didn't belong to him. He used to collect cells and then sell them or make them disappear. The cell became an important piece of circumstantial evidence because we were actually able to connect the victim's backpack to the suspect because of the cell phone. Armed with a photo of Jean René Cyr from his recent arrest without his famous mohawk, the police ask their key witnesses, the two friends of Charles, if they can identify the suspect. Charles's two friends clearly identified this individual as the one who had left Uville Square with the victim. And then we learned that this person, the suspect, lived at the Salvation Army. Investigators visit the Salvation Army shelter in Obey River, Quebec. The first person they speak with is Louis Vizina. He is very cooperative. Mr. Vizina informed us that on the night of the murder, another resident of the Salvation Army, uh, Mr. English, told him that something serious had happened. He did not give details, but he was with Jean-René Cyr, and something serious had happened. He was almost in a state of shock. With the statement from Vizina, investigators finally have a more serious lead. Mr. Louis Vicina brought a lot of elements to the investigation. The pills that were found at the scene were important because we were able to link this kind of medication to the suspect. A day or two before, the suspect had the same pills to sell. They call these peanuts for $5 a piece at Uville Square. We could identify these pills as Rivetril and Deserel, the two drugs in question. Rivetril is an anticonvulsant and anxiolytic commonly prescribed to treat epilepsy. Deseril is an antidepressant. Naturally, we had to wait to receive the official results of the analysis, but you could already tell that the pills matched the ones stolen from Mr. Vizina by the suspect. So it became an important piece of circumstantial evidence because, again, it was linked to the suspect. A search of Sears' room at the Salvation Army reveals some interesting evidence that might place him at one of the crime scenes. We found his tent hung up to dry. We could see that there was a small tent that had been used. And this was the only thing we found in his room that could corroborate part of that story, actually. Later, we learned that the suspect had a habit of camping on the banks of the St. Charles River. This was corroborating that part of the story. It's information we had received from his ex-girlfriend. But Vizina's statement is particularly useful because it puts the police on the trail of Danny English. He told Vizina that he had witnessed something serious with Jean-René Cyr. English is known to police and hangs out at Uville Square. Detective Doris Paget conducts the interrogation. When we met with Mr. Danny English at the home of his girlfriend, he was not intoxicated. He was lucid and seemed normal. However, Mr. Louis Vizina told us that when they met at the Salvation Army shelter, English was intoxicated and he was stressed by what had just happened. Detective Paget thinks Danny English could be the only eyewitness to the murder of Charles Tremblay. But his level of intoxication the night of the events was such that Paget has a difficult time piecing events together. To top it off, English fears a reprisal from Sear if he talks to the police. It took some time before he started to explain that he was with the suspect, Jean-René Sear, and a young man. He told us that he was extremely intoxicated, 
and that the suspect, Mr. Sear, supplied him with pills. English tells Detective Paget how he joined Jean-René Sear and Charles Tremblay when leaving Uville Square. So the three of them walked together. He said he had difficulty remembering some moments. However, he described the route they took, which ran along the St. Charles River in Quebec City. Despite his confused memory, English reveals how the events took a sinister turn. Indeed, there was a negotiation in connection with the purchase of narcotics. They began to argue because Jean-René Cyr had changed the price from what he told the victim earlier. He described that the suspect was not satisfied with the negotiation, the amount of money that the young man was trying to offer. In Mr. English's words, Jean-René Cyr got very angry. So at some point, the suspect took the victim by the throat and was punching the victim who ended up on the ground. Then Mr. English witnessed the victim being dragged and then the suspect picked him up and threw him over the wall to the lower level. The suspect then kicked him and then picked him up again and threw the body over the wall on the edge of the St. Charles River. And then Mr. English decided to run away. So essentially, it was a deal that went wrong. That's the motive in this crime. And according to Mr. Danny English, the victim was unconscious when he was thrown over the guardrail. This is basically what he said in his statement. We could also tell that he seemed afraid of the consequences of his statement. Danny English proves to be a key witness. For the first time, police have a plausible explanation for what happened to Charles Tremblay from the time he left the Uville Square until his tragic end. We made a written statement, something we call an affidavit. It's a statement which is sworn before a commissioner for oaths, or when possible, before a justice of the peace. And once accepted, it has the same value as a testimony in court. So this is what we did, a written statement. Investigators have significant circumstantial evidence and a signed affidavit from Danny English. They are waiting for the results from the blood analysis taken from the two pieces of tarp found at the scene. This latest evidence could seal the fate of the suspect, Jean-René Cyr. We could not say whether the blood was there before or after the event except that following the arrest, we had witnesses that told us that the suspect had injured knuckles the day after the event. So it was possible that the injuries occurred the evening of the crime or perhaps as long as a week earlier. Therefore, if the blood had been on the tarp for a week, that still put our suspect at the crime scene. The result of the comparison from the two tarp segments proves that the blood was from the same person. Well, if we find that it is his blood on the tarp, there has to be a reason why we found this piece of tarp with his blood on it at the scene of the crime. Moreover, the victim that we found had left Uville Square with him on the previous night. Only DNA analysis can determine beyond a reasonable doubt if it is the blood of Jean-René Cyr or that of Charles Tremblay. Will all this circumstantial evidence be sufficient to convince a jury? Will the blood-stained tarp found near the body of Charles reveal Cyr's secret? Will Sergeant Detective Tremblay's team be able to solve the case with just a few drops of blood? August 22, 2001, the body of a young man, Charles Tremblay, was found on the banks of the St. Charles River. The discovery coincided with a riverbank restoration project carried out by the city of Quebec. An important witness, Danny English, is identified and interviewed. 
The police learned that the night before, Tremblay went to the St. Charles River with a man named Jean-René Sear. When English last saw the victim, Sear was beating him mercilessly. The young Tremblay was never seen alive again. For investigators, the cause of the fight that led to the murder remains a mystery. He beat him, choked him, kicked him, punched him, and threw him over the edge to the lower level. Actually, we can't say if he was thrown down there or if he fell down. Aside from Sears' brutal temperament, the police never managed to establish the motive for his actions. It's frustrating. I mean, there's a railing about four feet tall. If the young man fell down there, it's because really he was pushed. And immediately after the victim fell, because it looked like a fall, the suspect walks down, goes around, it, it, because it weren't stairs, it's sort of a ramp for bicycles. So he must have walked at least 60 or 70 feet, about 30 yards before reaching the body. And then after that, throwing him into the water. But it's in his madness, in his violence, that all this happened. We can't say if he intended to kill him, but you can't not have the intention if you do that. Throwing someone unconscious into the water, it's certain he will die. Investigators use traces of blood left at the scene of another crime where Sear is a suspect. While breaking into his ex-girlfriend's apartment, Sear had cut himself on glass, leaving behind a valuable source of DNA. The police laboratory compares this sample with the blood on the tarp in order to charge Sear. But in 2001, DNA analysis was not as advanced as it is today. Oh, it was quite long. I would say it took three weeks before we had DNA results because this was back in 2001, so analyses took longer. And I know we pressured the laboratory because it was important. Of course, we were waiting for this. It was the icing on the cake that allowed us to accuse our suspect. The lab results prove all three blood samples match. The investigation gains momentum. The same day we received the DNA results, the prosecutor gave us the okay to press charges. It was very important indeed. Everything played off that analysis. It allowed us to place him at the scene, which is in fact the main evidence in the case, the suspect's DNA at the crime scene. So you could say these are all pieces of a puzzle. When you put them all together, it becomes obvious why our suspect is the one we arrested and charged in this case. Even though all the crime scene blood samples match, the two on the pieces of tarp and the one on the broken window, Sergeant Detective Tremblay wants to avoid any doubt about his DNA evidence. From the moment we had the results from the laboratory, uh, we asked for a new warrant to collect a blood sample for the suspect's DNA. Uh, a technician actually went to the detention center and took a blood sample from Sear, and that was returned to the laboratory. But this time, it was very quick to make the match. There was no doubt at that moment about the identity of the suspect. From that moment on, the wheels of justice begin to turn. But the trial immediately hits an unforeseen roadblock. After two weeks of procedures during the first trial, one of the jury members claimed to have received threats in a shopping center in Quebec, which meant the trial was aborted. As the trial against Sear begins, it is immediately derailed. Will Sears' lawyer ask to dismiss the charges against his client? The 
body of 15-year-old Charles Tremblay is found on the drained bank of the St. Charles River. The police learned that the night before, Tremblay is seen with Jean-René Cyr, a man with a penchant for violence. The investigation compares blood samples from two crime scenes to prove that Cyr is the murderer. The first trial is aborted after alleged threats to a jury member. But in fact, it was not true. It was invented by the jury member who was then charged with obstruction of justice. A new trial is scheduled with a new jury. But even then, the prosecution suffers another setback. Danny English did an about face, if I can use that expression. He completely changed his story. He came to court and said that the police had forced him to write that statement. Danny English definitely knew the suspect. He knew he was a very violent individual. He was afraid to testify against the suspect. That's what caused him to be uncooperative and unwilling to work with the police. The prosecution tries to discredit English's new version of events. The court even allows the prosecutor to deal with him as a hostile witness, even though he was the prosecution's own star witness. The jury did not believe his new story or his new attitude. It was not accepted. In the end, what he had written was taken as evidence, even though he claimed in the second trial that it was all false and untrue. In the end, despite the extreme violence of the crime, the police are stunned with the sentence. In fact, what led to the charge of second degree murder being accepted was the fact that the victim died by drowning. During the altercation, the victim was severely beaten. We can't know for sure whether after the fall he would have died. This would have been manslaughter because if a person falls and dies in a fight, we can't assume the other person intended to kill him. But the fact that the suspect went down to the lower level to pick up the body, which we can think of as 99% inanimate at the time, and then threw him into the river means he really intended to kill him. Because throwing a person who is unconscious into the water, naturally there's a 100% chance he will drown there. One of the incriminating elements was a simple piece of tarp that the accused left near the dead body of the young Charles Tremblay. One piece of tarp stained with the blood from the murderer. The most likely hypothesis is that after the event, uh, after the murder, the suspect left the scene with the victim's backpack and then proceeded to cross to the north side of the river. He went past the Laurentian Highway. He headed along the north side, and then he left the backpack and the cell phone on the promenade on the north side. And then he went to camp out on the piece of tarp. And naturally, when he awoke in the morning, he saw that the river had dropped and that the body was visible. The hypothesis is that he decided to cut off a piece of the tarp to cover the body so that nobody would see it. But when he got to the crime scene, there were already people out walking, so he simply abandoned the tarp. This is what we felt was most plausible. That must be why he returned to the scene with a piece of tarp to try and throw it on the body so that nobody would see it. But unfortunately, he was forced to abandon the plan because there must have been people around. The investigators think that if Sear had paid attention to the water level of the St. Charles, he probably would have made sure the victim sank and did not get stuck in the muddy bank. 
The charge against the suspect was second-degree murder. He was convicted and sentenced to 14 years in prison. Once again, a criminal foolishly believes water to be the perfect accomplice. In the end, the receding waters of the St. Charles River allowed Charles Tremblay some solace.